Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. You know, the ability to slog through no matter what's happening around you and continue to stay the course and stay focused on, you know, despite the heel biting that you're dealing with or the pieces that are getting taken out of you, you keep moving forward. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time I spent wrestling, if it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. Happy Thursday to y'all from the Windy City. My guest today is Chris Labreck. You may not know Chris from the wrestling circuit, although he was Division Three All-American back in the 80s. But Chris is a businessman, and he frequently speaks to teams about leadership, and that's how we got in touch. He did a presentation for you and I, and some of the coaches there put us in touch so that I could interview Chris, and and here we are. So enjoy the conversation, folks. This is Chris Labreck. Before we get to it, though, fan of the week goes to my man, Coach Rankin, left an awesome five-star review on Apple. Thank you very much, and I really, really appreciate it. If any of you are listening to this podcast on Apple, please leave a review and rate the show. Last but not least, folks, if you want to keep up to date with the podcast, please go to WrestlingChangeMyLife.com or you can visit our online store at store.WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. That's it, folks. Let's give it up for Chris Labreck. Peace! So let's let's dive right into your background and then we'll kind of move to some of the talking points you sent over. So, Chris... This is the first time we've met over uh, over a call here. Talk to me about your background and how you got intertwined with wrestling. So, um, born and raised in Jersey, um, Central Jersey, and I had an older brother, five years older than me, that wrestled uh, for a small high school called Homedale High School in, in Central Jersey. And then uh, I followed kind of in his footsteps. Um, I needed to wrestle because as a as a freshman, I was like eighty six pounds. I had to drink a gallon of water and a half just to make the <laughs> one hundred one weight class because I was too light. Um, loved the sport, just fell in love with it and, uh, wrestled in high school and in college. And then after college coached a little bit back at my high school and then got away from the sport. You know, I just started my career and got away from the sport for a while and then had a son, uh, and he, he was, he was five years old and, or he was four years old. He said he wanted to wrestle cause he had seen some trophies in a box somewhere. And, uh, I said, well, not until you're five. And woke me up the day after his birthday on a Sunday morning at eight o'clock and said, you got to get up, dad. We got to go to sports authority. I said, why? He said, I got to get wrestling shoes. He said, you said when I turn five, I can wrestle and they have practice at one o'clock. I'm like, oh, okay, kiddo. You know, so there it was, you know, I, next thing I know, I'm coaching the youth program at Shore Wrestling Club up in Jersey. And, um, you know, a lot of good kids come out of that program and come out of the, the related programs. And I just got back into the sport and I really loved it. Um, we, we transitioned and moved down to Florida in 2014 and my son took three years off. Um, he was doing real well. He was wrestling for triumph wrestling club and our club up in Jersey. And then, uh, he took three years off and, and I think that's done really good for him, giving him a break. And then he came back and I was kind of helping the local high school, but the, the coach resigned very sh- quickly. You know, it was kind of a surprise. It was like September. Um, and he decided he wasn't going to continue. Mm. So I raised my hand cause I was worried about the program here at Lake Brantley high school. And, um, the athletic director met me and she's like, you're hired. <laughs> you know, so I, 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 before that happened, I went to my CEO and the president of my company who are my direct reports. And they both said, you can't miss this opportunity. 
you know, you're not going to be in your son, you know, you know your son's not going to be in your life forever. You can't miss that opportunity to do it. And uh, they both knew how passionate I was for the sport. Yeah. So I, I got back into it. Um, and I, I'm loving it. You know, having a great time with it. How old is your son now? He is 17. He's just becoming a senior. Got it. Yeah. So yeah. this is his la last go at it. So you think this is your last year as a coach or will you keep going after that? I will, I'll be an assistant and I'll help the program. But there's, you know, you fall in love with these kids mm -hmm. uh, as freshmen and sophomores. And I got juniors and I got a bunch of kids who these big eyes, you know, they're just, they, they want to eat it all, you know, and I, you can't walk away from that. Um, you know, the, the thing I was fortunate to be able to pull off was to move our practices to, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. so I could continue to do my, my job mm. and then come home and go to practice. And that's actually worked out really well for the kids, at least last year and the year before, because they, you know, they go home, they do their homework, they get all that out of the way, they have dinner, and they come back to practice. And it, it's worked out fairly well. And then they go, their parents have told me they go home and they collapse. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. That's crazy. You guys practice at 8 o'clock at night. I've never heard of that before. 6 to 8, yeah. Oh, yeah, 6 to 8, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, six days. It's definitely not known, uh, not that, not that common. But you know, there's no way I could pull this off otherwise. Six to eight's not bad. Okay, that I thought you said eight at first. Um, yeah. So how? And I know you. A lot of what you do um, in terms of talks you've done with you and I is is related to leadership and, and stoicism and things like that. Let's start with how you got connected with the U and I program. So um, it was 2009. I started. Uh, thinking, you know, let, let's do a camp this summer. And I was talking to a buddy of mine and he said, well, you should try to get Schwab. And I'm like, okay. So I started talking to my wife about it. We were walking the dog one day and she said um, she had Googled him and gone onto a website and she realized that his wife, Allison, was from Virginia Beach. And Doug talks about this all, all the time. It, when he flew in, I picked him up at the airport and my company, we had just sold my company to another company. Uh, on April 1st. And I found out June 1st, the camp was June 10th. I found out June 1st that the senior partner was embezzling $25 million a year out of the company. And we had to unwind our, uh, our deal in the eyes of the IRS. And I was just, I was in professional hell uh, when Doug landed here. He's like, I don't have to do this. We can, we can go back. I'm like, no, no, this is, a, I need this right now more than anything. You know, it, it's a healthy distraction. So uh, that's when I met Doug and we just became fast friends. I mean, we talk, I spoke to him last night for about an hour. I mean, we talk all the time. Um, I challenge him. He challenges me on, on different things. We exchange, you know, reading material all the time. So I just, you know, that's how I, we started talking and, you know, it's been, it's been a really good friendship and, and, uh, you know, he's, he's a mentor to me in some ways. Um, and I think I do the same for him. So that's, that's how I got connected with the program. And I, I just love what they're doing. You know, it, yeah. Malin Conico did something on flow wrestling where he's like, there's something going on different at you and I, and there really is. I mean, it's the, the focus is building men as much as it is wrestling and just using wrestling as the shell for that. And when you talk about leadership, that's, that's really what we should all be doing with these young folks, whether we're in youth, high school or college, they need that kind of guidance. They need to see people go through tough things and how they handle it. Um, I've got two mentees in my company. One who, who would call me yesterday, he was really struggling through some things. And, you know, I, I probably spent 40 minutes on a call with him. They called him back at the end of the day, sent him a text after that and continue to talk to him. He's a very smart young guy. He doesn't, you know, probably doesn't need it, but it does help. Uh, you know, and, and I think that there's not enough leaders out there right now. And there are, a lot of kids who don't get what they need at home uh, mm -hmm. with respect to that, don't see those, those moments where, you know, people are helping each other and, and really learn how to trust each other. That's, that's something that's just not enough of, I think, you know, you can't have too much of it. So what's going on at UNI is, is pretty darn exciting. Um, you know, for me, there was a huge uh, kind of a social cue of what their program is about last year or two years ago when Drew Foster lost his last home match um, in West Gym. Mm -hmm. Not shortly thereafter, one of his teammates won a big turnaround match, and Drew was off the bench, jumping in the air almost as high as Schwab does. And it was just like, you know what? That guy's just got – he's so grateful. He's got no – like, he's got an ego, but not a – not you know, it doesn't get in the way. A lot of guys would have been sulking on the bench or in the locker room at that point, you know, having lost – and, and they're – you know, a few months later, there he is on the podium winning the national championship. So it, it tells you a lot about the importance of being grateful and humble uh, mm -hmm. and what, what they've done in that program to instill that in their guys, in their men. Um, 
and, and every one of those coaches, I mean, Brett Robbins, you know, Lee Roper, uh, Randy Pugh, Doug, all of them, um, Cruz Arhouse. I mean, these guys are all just solid throughout and, uh, and they're very unified and the approach is similar, you know, and, and the wrestlers, they, they buy in. I think they buy in and, and you can see the results that program's had over the last 10 years. Yeah, I love those guys. All, all the guys you mentioned, I know um, in some way or another, in, in some better than other, but, you know, Lee and, and Coach Schwab are awesome. Uh, you know, Cruz, actually, we were in the high school at the same time, so I remember watching him. Brett Robbins is an Illinois guy, so he was awesome. He was like a senior when I was a freshman. Um, yeah, I love, I love that, that program and those guys over there. Talk to me about some of the leadership gaps that you see in kids that you work with. Like, well, so, it, you know, it's very different, I think, um, demographically, where we were in New Jersey versus here in Florida. Um, it, that was a, it was a culture shift for me, particularly when I started getting involved with the local high school. So in New Jersey, you have a town and there's an economic, almost an economic parity in that town. Mm -hmm. You move to another town, that's a different economic demographic. And you move to a third town, it's a different economic demographic here in Florida, that's not the case. You got kids that, you know, can't get food and you got kids living in $10 million homes on the water, mm -hmm. all in the same school. Mm. And it's just a, it's a huge melting pot and, and the demographics are very different. So there's massive gaps um, and you have to approach each and every one individually because you can't, you know, it, it, it just their needs are so different. Uh, so from, from a coaching standpoint, it's almost like, it's like walking into a, a club wrestling room where you've got five-year-olds all the way to 20-year-olds. You know, the, the needs you're going to have, you're going to have to dig in deeper. Um, so I think there's, I think there's leadership gaps with respect to that, if that's what you're referring to. It, it's just things you need to be in tune to as you're interfacing with these folks, because a lot of them, I don't have their life experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just recently started reading Cast by Isabel Wilkerson to understand and we've got a lot of this right now. We have a lot of racial tension in the country. I mean, there's a lot of stuff lot. going on. You know? and, and I just, I, I recognize the fact that I grew up in a certain way and I just don't have the sight line and vantage point that a lot of these others have. And I can learn from them. They can mentor me as much as I can mentor them. Mm -hmm. It's just valuing their life experience, the lens through which they see the world and trying to understand that better. Um, because I think you can serve people more effectively when you do that um so you know from a leadership gap that that to me was the biggest thing that i saw going back into coaching down here in florida was just the the, the economic uh disparity that you see within one high school system um, and, and I, I i'm not exactly sure why that is the case i have you know some i've talked to some folks about that but uh fr from a leadership standpoint though i mean for me it's it's consistency is incredibly important mm -hmm. you, know, you can't you can't there can't be wild swings in, in in anything in your approach you have to be slow and steady and much like a math teacher would do you know get you have building blocks you know and you have to continue to work on those building blocks and 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 the one thing i learned coaching my son's team when he was five and six was there a couple of ingredients i had to bring into the room number one was i had to at least be perceived as having more energy than the most energetic kid in the room. Mm -hmm. They're not going to submit to you unless they think you have more energy. The other thing is understanding their intention span, right? So I use the whistle a lot and, and I didn't do anything for more than 30 seconds because five-year-olds lose their attention span pretty quickly. And that, those two things I've taken into, into business and they've helped me <laughs> tremendously. I think energy or at least the perception of your unending source of energy, people just submit you know, after a while. So if you use those powers for good, uh, that can be extraordinarily helpful. But I think consistency with respect to leadership is extraordinarily important that your, your message has to be authentic and it's got to be consistent over time. Consistency, consistency is big in terms of your expectations for those people as well. Um, in terms of, is it, you know, are you expecting them to, to get, to get up for a workout or, you know, to stay more, I guess, level-headed, but and it's not really coming out the way I want it to, but I guess ex consistency in terms of your expectations for the team is a big one. Um, ben Askren does some mental Mondays and he talks about that. And I, and I love, I still love those. Um, and you mentioned for your own team now, you, you apply some of those principles. So are you running a sales team or um, how does, how does that enthusiasm 
convey over the phone or, or in meetings for you? Yeah. So, like a, so, the crazy guy or what? <laughs> <laughs> no, in the no, best no, possible just, way. Yeah. Just lots of energy. Right. I mean, sure. and I think that people are attracted to that. That's something that mm -hmm. I think folks, they, they want to deal with somebody that, that has that energy. They're going to, they're going to run with them. Um, yeah, I run a sales team. I run a division of, of, of inside the insurance agency that we have called Iowa Insurance Office of America. I have about 125, 130 people in my department. And ultimately it all rolls to me, but I don't think top down. I think, you know, center out. I think everybody's at the same level. Um, but that, you know, you've got to bring that energy into the room and, but you also have to have a message that's behind it, right? Something that people can, can grasp onto. And I've heard Schwab talk about this as well as others that, that you talk about the process versus the results. Um, you know, in, in the insurance business, if there's a loss, you know, particularly, you know, in property and casualty, they, they talk about the proximate cause of the loss. What was the thing that actually drove it to happen? So instead of focusing on being number one or, or winning the national championship, focus on all the ingredients that get you there. Fall in love with that. Mm -hmm. If you fall in love with that and that's something that you're truly attached to, then, you know, that's and, and that's where you get your energy from. That's you're going to get the results. The results are going to be a residue of all the other things that you're that you're supposedly in love with, which is the process, the working out, the learning. And it's no different in business. I mean, I think people get they get so tied up in where they are in the next step that they, they, they squeeze the bat so tight they can't hit the ball. Um, they, it, relaxing, and one of the books I'm reading now is Ryan Holiday's Stillness is Key, which I think is really, really good stuff around you know, relaxing and getting in the zone that people talk about. The only way to do that is if you're not focused on the results, you're focused on you know, where you are in the moment and being present. And I think in business, that's extraordinarily important. And I think wrestlers have an opportunity more than other sports to be able to do that. Because there's, there's less distraction, so to speak. Right? You get in the cylinder with one other guy. There are things that can Im impact it, um, impact the match, the ref being one. But it's you and the other guy. And mm -hmm. so you know, if you can be present in that moment and not squeeze the bat too tight, man, that, 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 that's going to have extraordinary results. And, and once you've learned that, if you, can, if, you, if you can get that in your mindset, you can teleport that to any other thing that you do in your life. Mm -hmm. And it has you know, it's tremendous, tremendous impact. I find that when I get out of my own way, kind of in my head, I, I can really do great work. Um, it's when I start to overthink things and, and, and I'm not in that moment where, you know, I'm, I'm relaxed and really focused. That's, that's the thing. And, and you have to, again, it's process over results. If I keep thinking I've got to make that next sale or I've got to get my company to here or I've got to do that instead of, hey, let me just work on the building blocks that actually that'll take care of itself. I think it's a big deal. Um, and when I hear... I hear what Doug talks about with his guys. I hear what other folks talk about that falling in love with the process is a big thing. It really allows you not to squeeze the bat too tight. And it's something where stressing out about, you know, stress comes from worrying about the future or looking back on the past. And doing either of those things not only ruins the current moment and puts you in a bad mood, but it doesn't get you more prepared for the thing you're stressing out about. You know, it's like yeah. so counterintuitive, but it's so easy to fall into. I mean, it happens to me several times a day, you know, not every day, but I'll, it's re, it's a relentless quest of constantly worrying, like in the middle of a workout, you know, I'd be thinking, all right, what am I going to do after this? And then uh, the kettlebell workout is, is less effective and so on and so forth. So um, who are some, so you mentioned Ryan Holiday and I, he's my favorite author. I, I do have stillness is the key, but I haven't read it yet, but obstacles, the way ego is the enemy. Or two of my favorite books. What are some other books you've read on these subjects that we're talking about or that you and Schwab have even shared with one another that um, really stand out to you? Daniel Pink's Drive, I think, is really, really good. Understanding what drives people, um, how people are hardwired. That was great. Culture Code by Daniel Coyle is another one. Because um, I think, I, to me, in my business, and I think in any group setting, culture is so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's like room temperature. You know, if it's there and it's right, it feels kind of good, right? But if it's not right, man, it can destroy everything. You know, you drop the temperature in a room to 60 degrees, you're not getting any concentration out of anybody, right? So it's got to be culture. It's sort of an undercurrent, but it's extraordinarily important. And, and Coyle does a really good job of, of talking through that. I, I, I thought that um, Simon Sinek's Infinite Game that just came out was fantastic. So I have, I have a, a small group of folks 
called the Benefits Advisory Board. They're kind of like the leadership of my department. And each year I buy them a book in December, give it to them. And then we have, we have monthly meetings, which are now weekly because of COVID. So we've kind of paused this, but each month we would have a meeting and prior to the meeting, I'd send out an email with an excerpt from the book and then we talk about it and the implications that it has. And some of them aren't readers, but they've gotten into it. Um, I gave them uh, Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss, which of was course. great because it's snackable bites of stories and things that all have value and you can go in deeper. He interviews Ryan Holiday in that book, which is what got me to him, you know, it's what led me to him as well as some others that I've read. Um, yeah, I think, it, again, you, you can't read enough. I, I was not a big reader until about probably 2010. And then I just, I've become a voracious reader. I can't get enough of it. it you know, every Saturday morning, every Sunday morning, I wake up, I read for at least an hour to two hours. Um, and I've got a couple different books going now. I'm still reading Stillness is Key and, and, and Cast by Isabel Wilkerson just to understand better. But they're, they're helpful. I think you, you broaden your vantage point. You, you, you can deepen your knowledge if you really think it through. But what's critical, I think, Ryan, beyond that is to have others to bounce those things off of. So, you know, for, for me to have conversations with Doug about that, about things like that, as well as others, and I probably have maybe five folks um, that I can talk to about things like this. I think that that's, um, it's valuable because it allows you to wrestle with it verbally and, and kind of tussle through it. Um, and then the other thing I think we have an obligation is to pass those things on to others. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, can, you can absorb all the knowledge you want, but if you're not passing on to somebody else, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, what, why? Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you gift somebody? Why wouldn't you take that obligation and run with it? So do you read during the week as well or just get the time on the Saturday and Sunday there? Um, I, I used to, but due to COVID, like it's just the workload now is, you know, it's six to seven every day. And there's, there's just not a lot of time. Plus, we're, you know, we're pivoting on some things at the company and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got a number of different initiatives that are going. So I haven't had the time to do it. So I, I'll do it on the weekends. Um, yeah. That's why I started reading Stillness is Key to kind of calm myself down because I was getting a little wound up. Um, but it, that's, I, I try, I used to, but I'd like to get back to that. So it's why like is your work so much busier now with COVID than it was before? Well, so, um, you know, a lot of the things that the company was planning on doing, uh, we hadn't launched. And as a result of COVID and the, in the an expected downturn economically, we needed to, we needed to accelerate those things. So where I would normally have three or four projects going, I probably have 20 now. And, uh, and, and that, that's a lot to manage um, you know, at the same time, but yeah, we got a lot of good people in the department, a lot of good people in the company that are leaning in and helping. Um, that's, that's an interesting thing too. We talk about culture. Um, we deal with a lot of employers and we, we, we try to figure out what makes them, um, work real well or not work real well. And, and culture is the thing. And there's a lot, a lot of ingredients and social cues you can see and look at that help reduce risk for an employer. Uh, but what we've found is as a result of COVID, the ones that had good culture prior are doing pretty well right now. You know, they've got, they've got challenges as did everybody, but the ones that didn't have good culture are in massive trouble. Mm. So, so my team, I've spent the last five years just giving them autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Those are the three ingredients and in, in Daniel Pink and Drive will talk about that. That's really important. If you give them autonomy and the ability to, to make decisions on their own and allow them to fail, in small ways, but support them, you know, teach them and coach them, no different than being a wrestling coach. Mm -hmm. They're going to do great work. They're going to do incredible work. And what we saw, we, we, we started work from home um, on March 13th and within 10 days had 1400 employees, you know, up and running. And we've actually measured productivity over the last 90 days. And it's gone up by about two or 3%, which doesn't seem like much, but when you start to think about the fact that we gifted back to all of our employees about 220,000 man hours per year of commute time that they were able to now spend with their family. They got work-life balance that they never had before. And that's an average of a 20 minute commute, which I think is being conservative. Way conservative. Uh, yeah. They got, they got, they got uh, a lot of time back with their families and they've, they've actually performed better as a result. So what we look like, you know, a year from now is not going to be what we looked like in January, but it's not going to be what we look like now. But the companies that, and the people I think that created good culture don't need to be standing over people to see if they're doing the job all day long. Yeah. They're actually, they've given them the autonomy to do the job. And now from in a work from home environment, they're doing it. So if one of my folks decides they're going to run to public and do shopping from 1 PM to 2 PM in the afternoon, 
but they're working till six or so they're getting the job done. What do I care? You know, it doesn't make any difference to me. As long as we're delivering to our clients, we're giving them the things they need, but you got to have good culture to make that happen. You have to have trust. You have to have an environment where people feel engaged and they're all going towards the, a common thing. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? The culture is so important, especially in sales, because sales is, you know, it kind of reminds me of a wrestling team. You got a bunch of, bunch of wolves in the den, so to speak, both guys and girls. And, um, you know, everyone's very sensitive. It's, you know, it's just such a, you know, your emotions can swing so much in one day. And, you know, if you don't have culture, it's really easy for some of the folks who are underperforming to start getting on calls together and start venting and complaining. And then the toxicity train starts going. And, you know, early in my career, I was, I was a part of that at at a certain company that I'm thinking of. And it was, it was, it was just brutal. Um, but you also didn't feel like the manager at the time was being honest with you or had your best interest in mind. And so to your point, I do think it all comes back to culture in the sense that, and I'm going to steal one from my, uh, one of my favorite people, Mike Powell, but he's talked about trust, love, and truth. And he leads Chicago beat the streets now, but the, the part that's not mentioned in trust, love, and truth is vulnerability. And if you meet Mike Powell, who's one of the great leaders I've ever met within the first five minutes of you, he airs all his dirty laundry and really puts it all out there. And then you feel like, man, he's really shared. Now I can you know, be open to doing so. Um, do you see that come up at all in uh, some of the literature you read? Yeah, yeah. So vulnerability is a big thing. Simon Sinek talk, talks about the vulnerability loop is mm. where you build trust, right? I mean, it's critical. Like with my team, they know what I'm good at. They know what I'm not. And, and, I, and I'm very candid about that. And I try to work on my weaknesses, but I'd rather just amplify my strengths and have others fill my same. weaknesses. And I want to do the same for others, right? That's how, you, that's how you quilt a group together is to be able to do that. But without that vulnerability, you can't have trust. If you don't have trust, you don't have, you don't have a collective effort. Um, and you, can't, you certainly can't innovate. You can't do anything outside the, the engineering that's in front of you. You're not going to be able to make that happen. And I think, you know, I'm in the benefits business. So healthcare being the center of that table is critical. And there's no industry that needs more innovation than that. Um, so that's what we're trying to accomplish. So you got to build a, you got to build a volunteer army. Um, and you got to, the vulnerability is, is like the first ingredient in my opinion. They, they need to know that you're not perfect. Uh, because ultimately when you think about it, every single person, we were on a call yesterday. It's a, a study group session that I'm leading. Um, and there's 12 or 13 of us, uh, and, and it was probably the best session we've had of the first five so far. And at the end I said, you know, this is probably the best session we've had because every single person chimed in at some point and, and gave another vantage point that the others don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that I think is really valuable, but people, you know, in group meetings like that, sometimes they tend to hide. Yeah. Uh, See, so when you facilitate that, you've got to provide an environment that they're not going to get hurt. Um, give them, you know, encourage them to, to participate because every single person has value. Um, you know, my, my direct report president of Iowa, Jeff Lagos, super smart guy, probably, you know, the most emotionally intelligent person I know said to me one day, he said, you know, if I don't show up to work tomorrow, the company's going to continue moving along. But if Connie in the mailroom doesn't show up and open up the mail with checks in it, that's even more detrimental. So when you start thinking about people's value in the organization, there's nobody that doesn't have value. They, they all bring it. Uh, the, the key is to get them feeling that, to know where they reside inside that environment uh, and the value that that brings and, and be pr proud of that. You know, mm -hmm. pride is a, a massive thing. Recognize it. Recognition is, a, is an important thing. Um, but, but, you know, you talk about that, that sales room, the whole Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross thing, like that's talk about toxicity. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than that or boiler room, you know, worse yes. yet, but, uh, for movie references around sales, but, um, you know, you, you, for me, there's a lot of social cues of that kind of culture, that supportive culture and the sense of irreverent camaraderie, like kind of busting chops of each other, but not in a hurtful way at all. I think is, is that that's a social cue of good culture. Um, one thing I noticed about this company is we literally consummated, I sold, we, back in 2010, I had those, those troubles. We unwound our, our deal in the eyes of the IRS so we wouldn't be a preferred creditor and then resold to IOA on July 1st. Well, I got my laptop and my, my business cards on the last day of June and I opened up my laptop July 1st at eight o'clock and booted it up. And I see an email come in at 8.15 and it says, it's from one of the 
consultants in San Diego, I think. He said, hey, I've got a trucking concern and I, I don't know how to solve for this problem. He sent it out to every consultant in the company, every producer. And within 15 minutes, he said, hey, folks, got what I need. Thanks. Here's the top three answers I got. And here's why I chose number one. Well, in that moment, he scaffolded the whole group up one level. Everybody got a little bit smarter because they learned something that they might not have known. Not everybody needed that, but it happens probably two or three times a day in our organization throughout the entire company. We have 350 producers in the company, salespeople. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, when, when you have that sort of environment, man, there's no telling the, what you can accomplish. Um, it's not about the numbers. It's really about that kind of unification. You know, wrestling, any sport is a great building ground for, 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 for that sort of environment. Um, the challenge is you get into the corporate world and the focus is shareholder value rather than stakeholder value. And when it's shareholder value, you're, you're chasing the podium rather than the process, right? You're, you're chasing the result rather than the process itself. Mm -hmm. And you look, you know, a lot of companies, they live and die and breathe by on that, but that's not what we stand for as an organization. And I think the, the highest performing organizations are focused on stakeholder value rather than shareholder value. And I think that, you know, it, it, it's where you get to that moment. I, I actually sent a text to Roper and Schwab about a, two weeks ago. And I, I was like, you know, even I struggle with that, right? You start to get to a point where you're trying to really focus on the process, but you're like, hey, it'd be great if I could do that. And, and all of a sudden you start to find yourself slipping. How do you constantly guardrail against that? You know, it's, it's, got, it, it, it's massively difficult, particularly if, as you get higher and higher, so to speak, or closer to, let's say, an NCAA championship, man, that, that can consume you. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets harder and harder. The closer you get, the closer you get, it's right there. It's just out of reach. It takes such incredible discipline to come back and say, I'm just going to focus on, on, on my craft rather than the results of what my craft will bring, right? Yeah. And really stay disciplined there. Uh, you know, I, I didn't win an NCAA championship. I wasn't an All-American in D1. I, I can see that. Um, how, how problematic that can come and how difficult it is for those coaches to manage that for their athletes. Um, because I see it within, you know, my own team members. So it's, it's tough to deal with. How has stoicism impacted your thoughts on all this? And what does it even mean to you? I, I hate even using the word because I get the eye roll, but I know it's important to our guy, Brian Holiday. And I, I, I have read meditations once or twice, but it's just, it doesn't sink in for me. I think I'm more of a, I learned from example. That's why I like Ryan Holiday so much. He has just these great historical examples of whether it's Rockefeller or, um, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, there, there's tons in there, but the Rockefeller one really sticks out to me. But what does the stoicism mean to you and how does it impact some of the principles we've talked about so far? So I told you I only started reading in like 2010. Not, not that I couldn't read before, right? Uh, but I, I really kind of digested it a lot. But I only recently got into Ryan Holiday. I was actually uh, fortunate enough to be on a, a, a very small uh, WebEx um, with him in, I want to say it was in April. It was like me and like 20 other people. It was great. It was one of our carriers presented and it was a really awesome opportunity. And What do you I, talk about in that, in that particular WebEx? Um, he, mostly it was around obstacle is the way, uh, he, he focused most of the, the information on that. He talked about, he talked about, you know, COVID and the challenges that we're facing and, and how, you know, how, how obstacle is the way related to that. Um, and he used a bunch of different examples from the book um, and I, I, I really digested it and I read a lot coming into that meeting with him. And what I didn't know was that you know, by nature, I've been a stoic my entire life. And I don't know really why I haven't really explored a lot of that. Um, but what I said to Ryan, when I, I actually asked him a question, I said, you know, <laughs> uh, on suffering, and I think that's incredibly important, right? So I, I'm, I've never been the fastest, the smartest, the strongest, you know, the quickest or none of those things. But what I do have a really good ability to do is suffer more than most people. Mm -hmm. Like I can tough things out, you know, whether it's physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, been through a lot of things in my life. Um, and I'm blessed to be where I am today. You know, no, no regrets whatsoever, but an ability to suffer. So I asked him, I said, what does that mean? He said, well, that's stoicism. You know, the ability to slog through no matter what's happening around you and continue to stay the course and stay focused on, 
you know, despite the heel biting that you're dealing with or the pieces that are getting taken out of you, you keep moving forward. So to me, that's, that's what stoicism is. It's, it's to be stoic. It's to be, you know, here I am, this is what I'm doing and I'm staying the course here for the reasons that I have held dear and, and the values that I have and the morals and the ethics. I'm, I'm not breaking away from that. Mm. And the world right now is trying so hard to pull people away from their values. It's just, there's so many distractions right now that, you know, they, they can, that can lie to people and cause them to look in different places and get away from what they need to really be focused on. And that's, that's the reason I started reading stillness is keys so that I'm not getting pulled away by social media and into something like I, I watch the news, but it's very, very infrequent that I do. And I miss a lot of things, but a lot of it is just, to me, it just, it's, it's, they're, they're chasing shareholder value, right? They're not chasing truth. They're not, a lot of what's reported these days isn't reported accurately. It's just done for the purpose of getting ratings. And I'm not demeaning anybody. I'm just, you know, my, my frustration level with what you see out there and the distractions that it, that it provides to pull you away from what really is going to help an individual or a group or a company or a team. It's just, it's massive. So the stoicism to me, and yeah, I get the eye roll too. So I try to find other ways to say it. And, and that's why I like Ryan Holiday. I tried meditations too, but Man, that's tough it's to get through. Much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's deep and it's it's almost written in another language. And you, if you want to really be a student of this, then that's great for you. But I just, you know, I, I like the way Ryan reads and and the way he teaches uh, because it's it's been helpful for me, and I'm able to take it into my life and use it in certain ways. Uh, but stoicism to me is is for me specifically, and it's different for everybody, is just the ability to suffer and, and continue to slog through while you hold those things that you value so much dear very close to yourself. So you don't get you don't get pulled away from a lot of that. Mm. And I love how he talks about principles versus uh, habits and routines. I don't know if you uh, follow his, he has like an email newsletter, he sends that every week. It's amazing. But he talked about it recently. He's like, habits are, you know, I drink my coffee at seven, then I read the paper. Whereas a principle is something like every day I, I meditate, you know, the, you know no, no matter what, I do these five things every day. It doesn't matter what time I do them or doesn't matter, you know, how I make my coffee, so to speak. But it's more about just things that you do every day, regardless of, of your routine, because everyone's routines have been thrown up in the air with this whole COVID thing. So really encourage further reading on, on Ryan Holiday. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, you, you're in the corporate world now and you, you lead a huge team. Um, what are you, what are you seeing in terms of prospective employers and what they look for from, from athletes or from students coming in and why some might be more successful than the others? So uh, it's a great question. The, the social construct between employer and employee has changed. Um, I think it's, I think it's been altered permanently. Um, it, we were, and, and, I've said this about COVID, it's, it is a revealer and an accelerator. An accelerator of certain things, but a revealer of all. Um, it revealed for a lot of companies whether their culture was good or bad. Um, it's revealed a ton of things about human behavior. The social construct has changed. Um, expectations that employees have of their employer is going to be, even though you, know, you, you hear about the unemployment rate went from, you know, virtually 3% to, I don't know where it is now, 12, 20, some, some, some crazy range. I still think that the most successful companies are going to be the ones that are serving the employee in ways others won't and can't. Um, so safety is a massive, massive issue that employers are thinking about. Um, you know, and I'm not talking about proper lifting techniques and pandemic free services. I'm talking about, you know, Ethnic safety, religious safety, psychological safety, professional safety, financial safety, social safety, all these different things need to be met. Um, so, so what employers are looking for is folks, and, and it depends on who you are as an employer, where are you in that journey, right? So my organization, what we look for is, um, is smart people. Now, there's two kinds of smart people. There are people who know a lot of things, and there are people who can figure things out. And if you're innovating, I want the latter, not the former. I want the, the, the young lady or the guy who can figure things out because that's the one I, I, I'm interested in, in. And that's the one who's going to learn our business and then take it to the next level. Um, humble and, and grateful are really, really important. 
um, and just wildly curious. Mm. That's the other thing that I look for. I, I want to talk. I, I want to, I want somebody whose eyes and ears are huge, right? They're just a sponge. They're wildly curious about things, asking lots of questions because those are the learners. Those are the ones that are going to figure things out. Um, obviously the, you know, the block and tackle ethics, morals, you know, those kind of things, those are the things we look for. Hard work, diligence, the ability to, you know, grit, uh, which is something else. You know, Doug and I talked about that last night. Great book by Angela Duckworth. If you haven't read it, oh, yeah. grit, how she, um, you know, how she improved the West Point, uh, you know, induction criteria, you know, they thought they had it figured out and they were doing a great job, but then she came in and kind of blasted it up and really good stuff. Grit, grit's a very important thing. Something we look for uh, with our folks, um, ability to work within a team, uh, you know, and, and, and the, that's a tough one for myself and for a lot of people. I don't know why, but I'm glad you said that because to me, I feel like some people who are just driven and motivated and they just want to go, go, go. And they, and it's just, they have a hard time sharing communicating with others in terms of either their spouse or even people they work with and they're just take it on their back and handle it. How do you handle that? Oh, <laughs> I was that guy, right? For, for a long, I was that guy, you know, and, and then I, I started to realize like, but when I got asked to move from Jersey down to Florida and take over the department as managing partner, which is now present, um, I had to learn how to, how to not do everything myself. Um, you know, it, because there's no way to scale. And, and what I found, the blessing I found out of that was that I got the opportunity to elevate a lot of other people. Mm. And so, you know, once I learned that, then I understood what the ingredients were that I needed to look for, for others that can work within a team and get that. Like I, I wasn't that guy. I mean, I, I, I loved wrestling because I didn't have to, I didn't have to rely on the goaltender. I didn't have to rely on the point guard. I didn't have to rely on the quarterback. I got to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And the meritocracy that re wrestling is provided me that. But now when I went into business, I just figured I had to do everything myself. And I wasn't a great team player. Um, I had to learn how to do that. So, you know, I think one of the things that sports is, is, you know, there are a lot of people in my department who are athletes, mm -hmm. formerly women and men, and they're, they are really good at interacting with the team. Um, where, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting better at that. So I rely on them heavily to handle those sort of functions. You know, one, my, one of the guys on my team, Matt Williams, is a great guy. I mean, this guy's got a heart of gold. He wears it on his sleeve, and he just touches people in a way that I, I just don't. You know, I'm, I'm, I can be known as being a little prickly, you know, mm -hmm. a little, little kind of hard-shelled and, and intense. And that's absolutely true. You can ask my wife of nearly 30 years. She, she knows it. She's lived it. But Matt can just walk into a room and just touch people in, in ways. So, so, you know, I put him in positions to, to do that and do that for the team and make them, make them feel that way. And I think that's, that's really what you need to do. You know, I forget the name of the gentleman who wrote Good to Great talked about, you know, seats mm -hmm. on the bus, right people in the seats. That's kind of the key. That's the art of what you do as a leader is positioning people to not only be successful and reveal their best self, but where they're, they're, where they're going to grow and do really well and where they're going to be positioned, you know? So, you know, where, where Matt is really good at that, he might not be good at something else. So I insulate him from that and I put him over here where Chris is good at doing this, but not good at that, put other people there. And after a while, and create the culture that kind of quilts them all together. And that, Dan Coyle talked about it in Culture Code. You start flocking like birds. You know, you move, and if you've ever seen like a bunch of starlings move, it's almost like one cloud mm -hmm. or one unit, and they're not even bumping into each other, and their brains are the size of a grain of rice. You know, I mean, they've figured it out, right? Mm -hmm. Physically, if you can do that culturally inside an organization, whether it's a team or whether that's a business, the success you're going to have is so much greater than anything that you ever thought was possible, and the team will do things that you never thought they could do. It goes way beyond what your expectations are, but you have to provide the environment and the vulnerability trust and all those other things have to be there. Chris LeBrec, you're an enlightened man and I feel, I feel a little bit lighter. I feel a little bit looser after this conversation. It's been a crazy week and I, I needed this. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure, Ryan. You know, I think it, ultimately we're all just trying to figure this out. We got a lot going on around us, but I believe in humanity. I really do. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if the leadership out there, which includes every single person, I say leadership is everywhere, act accordingly, right? It, 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 there's, the world isn't as bad 
as you might see in the press or might be reading or might see other way and the hate isn't as deep as you might see i want to tell you that i think it's the outside bands that you're seeing it that have a louder voice than the pretty stable central focus so i believe in humanity i mean i just think that's what we need to focus on and treat each other really well um and we'll we'll be absolutely fine i appreciate the opportunity brian it's a pleasure meeting you um you know, first of many, to sir. First of many. Yeah. We're going yeah, yeah. to keep this That'd going. Be great. Love to. Perfect, man. Thank you again, sir. Have a great day. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Tom. Take care, y'all. Tom. Take care, y'all. Come. Take care, y'all. Come. Take care, y'all. Come.